Um, I'm your host, Patrick Canary. And this set of podcasts is presented to you and supported by uh, the Center for Innovative Practices, as well as the, and I hope I get this right, the um, Child and Adolescent Behavioral Health Center of Excellence at the Begun Center at Case Western Reserve University. So um, that's, that's quite an ambitious uh, login. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, part of a series that we have, and um, we're trying to focus on topical issues that are of concern to the child and family behavioral health systems. Um, I have two really great guests uh, joining today, Teresa Lample and Mark Meekham. And um, while I appreciate that you both sent me your wonderful bio sketches, um, there's so much in them both <laughs> that I'm just going to say uh, that you are two of the most incredible um, policy program advocates for kids and families that I'm certainly aware of in our state. And Teresa is the executive director, CEO of the Ohio Council. And Mark is the executive director and CEO of the Children's Ohio Children's Alliance. So thank you both um, for being here. We will post your bio sketches when we post the podcast. So folks who don't know you, and I assume that's relatively few, but for the folks that don't know you, um, they can look and see the details. You do have really incredible, impressive uh, backgrounds uh, all across the domains that are affecting children's mental health and behavioral health today. So I appreciate your insights and your expertise as we get, as we get rolling here. Um, any just opening comments you wanna make or any initial thoughts uh, before I kind of jump into kind of a Q and A, although we wanna really keep this as conversational as possible, but I just wanted to make sure if you had anything you wanted to say at the top, you can do that. Just re really briefly, um, you know, thanks again for the opportunity uh, to join you on this important podcast. I just think this era, this time is so crazy. It's still so bizarre. It's unprecedented. Um, it's really fascinating. I mean, the challenges that we're all facing and the solutions and uh, strategies that we're seeing are fascinating too. So this is such uncharted territory, it's exciting. Um, and it's uh, such a great topic for a podcast like this to really cover. Thanks, Mark. I, I concur. And I think some of the things that you commented on, we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, later in the discussion. Is anything, any initial thoughts from you? Sure, I'd like to echo my thanks, Patrick, for you hosting this session today and having the opportunity to talk about it. You know, we do live in unprecedented times, and one of the most exciting and most challenging things is that everybody's talking about behavioral health and well-being. Yeah. Um, I think we have an opportunity to really think about how we talk about this as brain health and really understand how we can bring the mind and body together in a way to make sure that we're, we're treating the whole child, the whole family, the whole community, and really looking at this, um, you know, this phenomenon that we're dealing with. Um, as a healthcare issue, as a public health issue, and really um, figure out how we move forward together to making this um, a substantial conversation that really helps people be healthy and well. Yeah, I agree. Well said, both of you. Um, you know, I think we all have been in this work long enough to know that we do search for the silver lining because there's also a lot of time of crisis and dark clouds. And we certainly have been encountering those in the last, certainly in the last two years, and more recently in the last um, couple of months. And I'm hoping, like you are, that the silver lining to this really angst-filled time is the, the discourse that's happening, which sounds, I'm going to just say it, sounds different to me, um, than it has sounded for a while. Um, so I really hope we do everything we can to take advantage of the attention 
um, that these issues are getting at the moment. So without further ado, um, as I was saying before we started recording, that it's really hard to separate um, the clinical crisis, if you will, from the operational crisis of our system. Um, and certainly it's difficult to separate workforce as a exclusive topic within that area. So I think in our conversation today, um, I think we'll hear and see some back and forth between the focus of our comments, your comments, being on maybe the clinical aspects, what we're seeing happening with our kids and families, as well as then the uh, infrastructure side, the, the financial side. So, so just bear with me as we ping pong um, across that conversation. I do not remember a time when on any given day I could Google children's mental health that I wouldn't see an incredible number of sources jump up that are not very old. So we're not talking, you know, 2000 report on children's mental health, but so much coverage in the media, so many reports, so many official statements from organizations regarding the recognition of this national crisis, as people call it. Um, it's, it's impressive. Um, and I hope that the message is getting across. What's encouraging is that I think a lot of it's also coming through the popular media. <clears throat> it's not just coming from official journals or official websites of organizations, but a great deal of um, popular media is covering it. So that's just kind of my segue to the fact that both of your organizations have done your own reporting uh, on this situation. So that's kind of where I wanna start is if each of you could highlight some of the salient uh, points from each of the recent uh, reports that you've issued. So the Ohio Council has issued your um, breaking point report, as well as your report on telehealth. And Mark, you've uh, all just released, I think last week, maybe the week before, um, your report and survey. So Teresa, if you could jump in and start and, and just talk about your reports uh, and any other reports, it doesn't have to be just yours, but um, it, for sure the ones that you're most familiar with. And like I said, we will be posting so far, the library I've accumulated is pretty good. Um, and I'll be glad to include anything else that you all have. Um, but your reports, your respective reports will also be um, posted along with the podcast. So, Teresa. Sure. Thanks, Patrick. So, you know, from, from the behavioral health workforce provider side, it's the shortage of workforce that really um, providers view as a breaking point. And that's why we named it our, our report breaking point is we really see it as that um, you know, rec staff recruitment and retention has proven to be the number one challenge that we're experiencing. We did a survey of our members late um, last year at the end of 2021, and what they shared was that 98% of our membership, and we have about 162 member organizations that serve adults and children, um, mental health, substance use, family services, so really across the lifespan. But 98% of the members that responded were having trouble recruiting staff, and 88% were, were having difficulty retaining staff. So when you look at that, that's, that's a stunning number. And the primary reasons were generally the overall lack of applicants, but when you did get applicants, they weren't qualified applicants. And if you did get to the point of hiring, the next challenge was unrealistic expectations for salary and wages um, compared to what they can receive in other sectors of not just healthcare, but now we're competing with new industries. We're competing with the service industries, we're competing with fast food, we're con competing with uh, distribution centers. But when you really think about it, and I think it's really important what you talked about, that talking about workforce and talking about clinical care can't be separated because what that really leads to it's, is primarily, it's an access problem. So mm -hmm. when we looked at some of the data, we've seen that, you know, 
pre-pandemic, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services did a survey, and they saw the growth in the demand for mental health increase 353% between 2012 and 2019. We know those numbers have gone up exponentially since. In fact, I was reading a survey um, just yesterday that said that for youth, the number, the number of, of youth experiencing depression has increased by 50%. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing women reporting, you know, an increase of mental health conditions, um, a third, and, and, and half of men um, are also recruiting, recruiting increased mental health concerns. So everyone is experiencing um, increased demand for services. And then parents are finding they're spending more time you know, focusing on the needs of their children's mental health, including their losing work days. Um, and they're spending time at work having to respond to the needs of their children. But when we talk about access and we talk about the workforce, if you took every single licensed behavioral health professional and assigned them a caseload based on just need, um, those who were seeking care, it would be a ratio of 380 to one. Now I'm a licensed you know, independent social worker. So that would mean that for me to have that caseload, if I worked 40 hours a week, every month, I would still have 200 patients that I couldn't see. So that's an incredible number when we think about access, when we think about the challenges that we're, we're facing. And what we find is that because of that, the, the wait list, sorry. So when we think about wait list, what we've seen is, is, is wait times have increased and access to care has, 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 been, has been a challenge. So what used to be days and weeks is now weeks and months. Yep. And one of the other challenges that we, we, we see anecdotally is that more and more people are finding the only way to access care is to pay cash. So those are really hmm. some of the, the primary challenges when we're thinking about the workforce and, and what it means um, when we ask our members how many of you are seeing increased demands for services? And 70% said they've seen an increase in demand for mental health services for adults and kids, and 60% reported an increase in, in demand for services for substance use conditions. So across the board, tremendous increase on a system that was already, you know, well understaffed, under-resourced, um, and really, um, you know, I think from the governor's state of the state address, one of the things he talked about is we're a system that was never built. And so how do we build the system and, and fulfill the promises made all the way back to the Community Mental Health Centers Act of 1963? Yeah, well, you know, and, and speaking of that Community Mental Health Centers Act, if I'm not mistaken, in this new legislation um, that our federal government is considering, uh, regarding uh, in the package with um, you know gun control efforts, children's mental health resources. I think I read that there's also some effort to create an infrastructure um, that kind of sounded like community mental health centers of a generation ago. Is that, am I correct? Or am I just imagining that I read that somewhere? No, so that's correct. Um, one of the key elements that's been included in the package from what we understand, and, and I, I was telling Patrick earlier, I just came back from DC from a policy academy, is that the, the concept is what's now called Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers, right, that, that was or the CC, CCBHC. And it's a model that is really designed to be integrated. It in integrates mental health, substance use, and primary care. It's a population health approach. It includes access to crisis services, as well as a range of highly coordinated services, taking kind of a public health approach. It has a financing model that is similar yet slightly different to the federally qualified health centers or FQHCs, mm -hmm. so that it creates a more sustainable financing option that really looks at paying for services based on episodes or engagement, um, more of a population health management approach um, that's a prospective payment, not just a, here's what's covered under an, an allowable cost structure. Right, right. Also, I wanted to pick up on your point um, about um, some, some of the clinical concerns. I was, uh, was watching uh, part of a webinar yesterday. Um, I think I want to say it was from the National Academy of Sciences, but I wouldn't swear to it, but I will clarify that. Um, when we post this, um, <clears throat> and one of the graphs uh, indicated 
um, as you said, the depression factor, but also, and I had not seen this piece, I saw the anxiety factors have also gone up, but I hadn't heard anybody talk about um, behavioral concerns um, being on the increase. So, I mean, not, not surprising, but you generally hear people talk more about anxiety and depression as kind of the, the, the twins, if you will. And in this particular presentation, they talked a little bit about also the behavioral concerns that are um, on the on the rise with kids. So, um, Mark, do you have any um, reflections or comments you want to make about what um, Tracy shared, or you can just jump into your report, your sure. survey? So at, at the Ohio Children's Alliance, um, we're a similar organization, um, but we have like a different a uh, little bit different audience. Mm -hmm. We have a, about over 80, 85 uh, community-based organizations around Ohio uh, that are part of the Ohio Children's Alliance. And they primarily are in the domains of children's behavioral health and foster care and child welfare. So we actually uh, commissioned a, an, another workforce report um, like the Ohio Councils uh, with this you know, different audience. And, uh, you know, to frame this report and our findings, I first wanted to recognize that the amount of support and funding and resources that the federal and state government have provided since the beginning of the pandemic, which is really the beginning of the intensity of this workforce crisis. I mean, it's been unprecedented and, and amazing from mm -hmm. so many different federal agencies and state agencies, different perspectives. Um, so, so some of, I mean, that level of support has been unheard of in our sector. Mm -hmm. I, we just had an, a, a realization a little while ago that every type of organization in the Ohio Children's Alliance has been a recipient of mm -hmm. some type of relief funding from government, federal, state, whether you're a group home, residential center, mental health agency, foster care agency, adoption, that's never happened before. That's a great um, observation. I'd not heard that. And actually, um, in reading the um, Surgeon General's report on protecting children's mental health, um, I really appreciated that his approach was, um, he has, you know, as you know, the chapters are focused around can do. So which segment of our collaborative group can do what and the idea that um so many organizations and not just our social service organizations or health organizations but other organizations including philanthropy all have some can do uh, you know expectations and so i think you know while the federal money is welcome and as you said unprecedented um, I think we'll have to keep pushing for those other resources to become part of that as well. But so go on. That was a great point. Yeah. I have not heard that. Um, no, abs absolutely. And all of those resources have made a difference, but the crisis is still very much here. Um, some of the governmental efforts are short term. Some mm -hmm. are setting the stage for more longer term impacts. Uh, but we're still very much in crisis today. Um, many agencies are down a third of their staff. So if they were fully staffed, that means that they have about a one in three positions are vacant. Um, years ago, th there's always been some element of workforce challenges in the child and family services sector where different segments of the workforce were more challenging than others to fill. Uh, but as Teresa said, every category of employment in child and family services is in crisis. Even um, as part of our survey, we, we looked at all the different categories from administration to case managers to clinicians, even at the lowest category administration, 22% uh, of organizations rated that as their uh, greatest you know, staffing need. Um, so even, smallest percentage is still enormous. That's, you know, yeah. over one, one fifth. Um, 
So it's it's pretty amazing how how wide the uh, the workforce crisis is and how it is affecting every element of community services for children and families. Um, and as Teresa mentioned, the impact of this gap goes directly to kids and families. It goes directly to length of waiting lists, to whether or not families will give up on attempting to access care. Mm -hmm. And it goes to fi finances. Some families are paying out of pocket for the types of services that they that really aren't ideal. Um, so solving the problem would be tremendous in terms of the impact on individual children, on actual families and communities as a whole. Uh, so there's all sorts of solutions that are in the works and that should be in the works. And it's not just government. Um, we all have different roles to play, large corporations and communities, large employers, community foundations. So in our report, the way we, we ended it is some opportunities for improvement, um, some recommendations, and it falls into four big categories. And some of these recommendations don't cost any more money. It just requires a lot of thought about how we can redesign and streamline uh, how government is involved in community services. So the, the, the four big categories are licensure reform, how our government oversees community agencies and practitioners. And then the second is investment in recruitment and retention efforts um, to amplify the work of community agencies. The third is uh, really focusing on reducing burnout and turnover mm -hmm. rates. And there's so much government can do or stop doing uh, to really Im impact that. And then finally is to eliminate red tape for community agencies. Um, there's a lot of work already underway um, within the relevant state departments in Ohio to address that. But we have just so many opportunities uh, to address a workforce challenge. Uh, and again, many of it involves new sources of funding mm -hmm. and much of it involves just rethinking the way that government is supposed to op operate in, a, in impact community services. Great, you know, and I think we'll have a chance maybe to talk a little bit more in detail on some of those recommendations. Um, Teresa, any thoughts from you on, on Mark's organization's uh, research? Data. No, I mean, I, I think we're, we're very, you know, we, the findings are not unique. They're, they know, we know what they are. I think the other thing that, you know, we talk about, we have to find a way to value this workforce, you know, and the governor spoke to this about having a behavioral health workforce that is, is valued and viewed as heroic. And I think if the pandemic showed anything, it was, yeah, behavioral health was recognized as, as essential as essential health, we were essential healthcare workers, except we're not. Um, when you look at where we're classified, for example, um, from a federal perspective in the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we're not in healthcare. We're in health and we're, we're in human and social services. And if I, you know, I, I share this story often. My daughter, who um, was a high school freshman last year, we started looking at, you know, the career exploration type things you start looking at the categories and this was through Jobs Ohio. And, uh, you know, I've been doing workforce um, advocacy for the behavioral health space and the healthcare workforce since I wrote my first paper in this subject in 2014. And we have now doubled the problem in terms of the shortages um, since that I wrote that first paper. So we were looking at Jobs Ohio and the career exploration. And I was just curious, I started clicking on things to find out well, where do we put people? Mm -hmm. And so you go to healthcare and you find doctors and nurses and pharmacists and, you know, um, home health aides and, and home health workers and things of that nature. But counselors, social workers, therapists were in social service and we were listed right above barbers and hairdressers. Now, I love a good barber and a good hairdresser. They're very important people. Um, but that's where we're categorized. And that's one of the challenges. And then you think about the fact that we have clinicians who are master's trained clinicians 
they're graduating from college. The average social worker graduates from a master's program with $78,000 in debt. And they're gonna take a job if they're in one of our organizations, either mine or Mark's, either one, any of the, any of the community agencies, and we're paying an average salary at a master's train level of around forty-five dollars to $47,000. Juxtapose that to a recent release from the, you know, from the administration around in-demand jobs that don't require a high school degree. And you've got jobs that look at you know, tech, um, IT, but my favorite was a food service manager with a median salary of $53,000. So there's a value statement that gets made. So from a recruitment, from a retention perspective, one of the things that we really have to work on across the sector um, that I think you know, we really have focused on is we have to build a pipeline. We have to build not just recruitment and retention, but how do we create a pipeline so people can see a viable career path Mm -hmm. It will not only be something that they enjoy, that they're mission driven mm -hmm. or focused or passionate about, but also allow them to have a living wage and support a family. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the critical challenges that I think, you know, I'm really excited that we're working on. And I know that, um, you know, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services is kind of leading this effort with higher ed. Um, mm -hmm. They recently put out an RFP to put together a workforce planning process so that we actually put together a roadmap for how do we create these on-ramps and off-ramps so that people have opportunities um, from a high school graduate to a two-year degree to a four-year degree to those who go on to get a master's or a PhD or a doctoral degree, because we need everybody. We need psychiatrists, we need addictionologists, we need, you know, child psychiatry has been a challenge for, you know, decades. We've been at one to 10,000. Um, in terms of one, one child psychiatrist every 10,000 kids, which is not near enough. And so how do we solve these problems? We have to make this value proposition that these are really important um, jobs that will really help people and to take those people who are passionate helpers and be able to match them with these jobs. And, and you know, and I would say that one of the strategic advantages, although it's huge, um, is, and just speaking for myself, um, you know, our systems tend to be fairly incremental in how we problem solve and how we identify problems. And I think this moment, I think, has demonstrated that while we're not going to be able to do, uh, you know, a 180 overnight, this is this requires more than incremental thinking and it requires more than putting each of those issues in its own separate lane um that integration of how as we talked about at the beginning of this discussion that integration of the clinical and the operational has got to happen you know kind of simultaneously so um i'm with you i think those are you know, really great points. Um, I wanted to take just a slight detour from our bigger picture uh, discussion because I I wanted to use um, telehealth as an example of you know something that emerged. Um, I mean, it was it's been around for a long time, but emerged you know considerably. Its ascendancy was significant. Um, over the last couple of years. And I know that both of your organizations have been involved in, in that uh, implementation. And so just by way of example, I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about how that came to be, how that is playing out and where we see it going as, you know, I don't want to say we're bookending this pandemic yet, but we're at a we're at a different place than we were, you know, 12 months ago. So, Mark, do you want to reflect sure. on, on where telehealth landed in in all of this? Yeah, and really, where I have to start is when the pandemic and the public health emergency in Ohio began. Um, we we collect data on the use of telehealth among our provider agencies. In the months leading up to, I believe it was March 
uh, when the public health emergency began. The typical month-to-month -month utilization of telehealth as part of the client's treatment mm -hmm. um, impacted about 2% mm. of the, the uh, clients served by community mental health agencies. Immediately upon the public health emergency, uh, that jumped up to about 98%. And it has gone down a bit, but it has more or less leveled off between 70 to 80%. And there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Um, so, so what that really means in practice isn't that 70 to 80% of people that receive mental health services get it all virtually. Sure. Uh, but instead, community uh, mental health agencies have been able to retool their resources, retrain their staff, and engage differently with clients so that about three fourths of those clients during any given month receive some type of service via a virtual means, in a, usually in addition to in-person. So the, the big best practice finding that's really um, come out of the pandemic is technology is there. People are used to it, it's very accessible. So instead of being an alternative way to receive mental health services, it's becoming like an augmented way mm -hmm. to enhance how services are provided and how we can reach people, including parents who may not normally have been engaged in the child's therapy, but with a 30 minute Zoom meeting during a work day, they can be mm -hmm. without, you know, relying on public transportation and appointments and, you know, hours and hours of their time. Uh, so that's, that's been our new focus of really trying to unpack the best practices of telehealth, not as a complete alternative to in-person mm -hmm. services, but as this new kind of layer that we build upon uh, mental health practices. So I would be correct in assuming that most providers who moved into the world of telehealth or stepped up their capacity for telehealth that a majority of them are staying with that as a option, as a tool, as a resource um, on, a, on an ongoing basis going forward. Correct, and it varies based upon what kinds of programs and what kinds of services. Sure. Uh, but for the most part, when it comes to outpatient uh, therapy and when it comes to different types of family, like intensive services, virtual is such an important and convenient uh, component that should be part of that package. But there's also plenty of services where it's just not very applicable. It's not extremely helpful. And sure. the younger kids get, the more difficult it is to really engage with them effectively uh, virtually for a significant period of time. Yeah. So Teresa, from your, from your organization, your members perspective, what, what, what's the story there with with telehealth and its role? When it comes to, to telehealth, you know, so Ohio was really a national leader and we threw telehealth wide open to include not just any type of audio visual platform, but the importance of audio only. And particularly when you think about reaching families, reaching parents, and most importantly, when you think about reaching grandparents who are parenting children, there really was an age divide that we discovered um, around comfort level with, sure. um, with, with telehealth, particularly audiovisual. Um, so being able to do that um, really did provide new opportunities. It overcame barriers to transportation and childcare that we have struggled to, to deal with for so many years. So mm -hmm. having the ability to provide you know, telehealth as an option and knowing that we transitioned as an entire industry from all in-person care to all telehealth care in two weeks. And an important thing to understand, Ohio um, in our data, um, and I've looked at many different states, but Ohio's Medicaid data in the behavioral health space saw no decline in access. So the, the level of utilization of behavioral health services remained steady through the entire pandemic, which was not true of other health conditions mm -hmm. and not necessarily true in other states who didn't do the same type of wide open policy that allowed 
you know, um, typical platforms like we're using today, you know, Zoom, FaceTime, um, things that, you know, that were not necessarily secure or HIPAA compliant, mm -hmm. um, but we allowed this wider flexibility, um, which then allowed our workforce to feel comfortable in learning new ways of doing business and being able to still reach their clients. So I think, you know, the hybrid approach is very real. Um, there are some people who prefer in-person and we see sure. more of that in the, um, in substance, in the substance use arena. Um, people in treatment for substance use tend to prefer to want more in-person, whereas in many of the mental health types of care, it's if particularly office-based services, they're more comfortable um, having the option for telehealth. But mm -hmm. as the intensity of the conditions get stronger and in-home services, having the ability to do both and having a both and approach really becomes important. Mm -hmm. And from a staff recruitment perspective, we know many staff, many work, workers are now saying, we want the flexibility to do both. And so how do we create those workforce policies that allow that, but still recognize and value that, you know, that, that choice, the patient choice, the, the youth, the family choice of what works best for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are the pieces that we're going to continue to struggle with as we move forward. And then I think the other piece, you know, we've, we've, we've managed, we've passed legislation in Ohio um, that, you know, secured some of these flexibilities mm -hmm. and, and really um, helped some of our licensing boards understand and appreciate the importance of telehealth and the access, particularly in the mental health space. Um, nationally, uh, still 36% of all telehealth claims are um, for a mental health or a substance use condition. It's by far the greatest uh, utilization across the country um, in, the, in, in claims just based you know, services. Um, so we know it's valuable and we know it works. And it's still a little early to say that there's no difference in outcomes, but the early studies show there's no significant difference in outcome performance when you get a, a, a virtual visit versus having an in-person visit. And that's going to be at the end of the day, I think what we look for. And then going forward, you know, to kind of talk about where I think some of the challenges lie. Hey, we're gonna have an end to the public health emergency and some of the flexibility. Yeah, can I ask about that, yeah. Are potentially at risk. If we have to go back to, you know, doing first in-person visits, well, then you throw up a barrier to using um, telehealth in an ongoing way. Um, and then if we have to transition to using only what are considered HIPAA secure platforms where you have to have secured logins, it really will create challenges where there are lacks of, lack of broadband um, or you know, people don't have access to technology um, that's not the typical technology. So there's more barriers that we know we have to work through um, you know, Medicare tends to be the, the, the goalpost that everyone looks at. They have made provisions for the next two years to allow telehealth for mental health services, including audio only, but there are some conditions. Mm -hmm. So like you have to have been seen in person um, within the previous six months, and then you have to be seen in person at least once every 12 months after you've initiated mm -hmm. telehealth. So they want to study it, which is all, which is very good. But I think those are some of the things that we'll be looking for. You know, practitioners, um, the way telehealth licensing works, um, if you're a, a pre professional, is you can only provide services to clients that are in your state. So what happens when a student mm -hmm. goes to a different state? You know, maybe they're on vacation, maybe they go live with a grandparent, they've got a relationship, but I'm not licensed in Indiana, and that's where the grandparent lives. So now I, even though I have the technology capacity, I don't have a scope of practice that allows me to serve the person because they're in a different state. So the state by state licensure issue is going to be something we're ultimately going to have to grapple with. And then the other advent is these, you know, large kind of national telehealth companies. Um, and how do we create a, 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 a regulatory structure that creates a level playing field mm -hmm. and make sure that we're actually continuing to focus on patient safety, um, mm -hmm. particularly with prescribing and prescribing of stimulants, which has really caught some national attention lately. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think it's, you know, that's such a great example of um, 
moving from the kind of the general concept of telehealth, like, oh, you know, what, you know, here it is, and what a great idea, and, you know, now we have folks, and then you begin to, it's like anything else, you begin to unpack that and pull back <laughs> this, the onion skin and realize that, it, again, there's probably years of work ahead to kind of get it um, where we need to, but again, the silver lining is, as you indicated, at least some of the preliminary studies on outcomes, which of course is something people are going to pay attention to, seem to be, you know, pretty good. And so it's like if we're if it's working, how do we keep it working, um, and and not lower that outcome by Mark? You were talking earlier about particular barriers, you know, HIPAA being one of them. Not all of HIPAA, but some regulations being one of those barriers. And how do we, you know, protect, you know, folks' privacy and their choices around that, but also make something available and accessible? So again, it's a kind of that balancing, balancing act. So I just wanted to use that as an example because I think that um, what I hear in that story. Um, are so many of the aspects of a system that's being resilient, a system that is looking um, to be able to pivot quickly, which clearly we've demonstrated our system can do um, because it's gonna need to continue to do that. Um, so thanks for kind of illuminating that, you know, kind of that, that side piece, because I think it's been one of the areas where people have, you know, really be been aware of the impact. So um, hopefully moving forward uh, at the federal and interstate level, we'll be able to continue pushing that. Um, I, I wanted to ask you both um, also, um, I know you're not, um, I'm not asking you to speak for, our juvenile justice and child protection uh, sister agencies, but you also both have members who work intimately with those systems in terms of service delivery and support. Um, I'd be interested in some of your reflections around how what, quote, our system is seeing in regards to these um, workforce challenges, how those are playing out um, in juvenile justice and in child protection, child welfare. And Mark, I think you mentioned particularly your membership. Um, you've got folks in foster, you know, foster care providers. and um, Sure. Um, well, just kind of beginning with juvenile justice, one of the types of community services that courts really rely upon are intensive family focused mental health services for kids, for kids that uh, come to the attention of the court for various different reasons. So that juvenile justice system has to cope with the same workforce challenges that the behavioral health system currently has. So there are uh, many great models in Ohio, many great programs in Ohio that are effective, cost efficient, and work really well, but to scale those up is incredibly difficult and it takes more than money. Um, mm -hmm. There've been recent investments and grant opportunities that many organizations have just had to pass by because if they receive a grant for a certain number of, of dollars, that doesn't necessarily translate into having the ability to hire a whole team right. to actually use that funding and implement that service. They can't find the people to begin with. Uh, so courts uh, need more intensive family services uh, for their kids and their families that come to their attention and there aren't enough of them in Ohio because of that workforce challenge. And then on the child protection standpoint, uh, there's there's a couple of different uh, categories here. First is foster parents. There's not enough foster parents in Ohio. There's not enough foster parents in most states, uh, but the impact of the pandemic has really worsened it. Um, it's the amount of kids that need homes 
has increased in the amount of homes that are available to serve those kids um, has basically leveled out and decreased a little bit. So there's a lot of uh, good efforts underway, including a brand new effort around the It Takes Heart campaign in Ohio to expand the amount of foster homes, uh, but there aren't enough. Meanwhile, there's about 15,000 kids in children's services custody that need a place to stay. Um, so there's the foster homes and then there's the uh, residential and group homes mm -hmm. that have, have really uh, probably suffered the most with the workforce challenge because they were the ones that had this challenge before the pandemic. This is like some of the most challenging jobs uh, to fill. It's some of the most challenging work to do. So coupled, coupling that with being able to work at Arby's and have you know, almost twice as great pay than working in a group home residential center, um, that translates to really uh, understaffed, some understaffed units, hours and shifts that are not very desirable and then uh, lack of access. So a lot of these programs are just continually running at capacity. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, child protection needs more slots. They need more opportunities for their kids to be placed in these therapeutic environments. And they're just not there. And that leads to all sorts of bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, kids being placed far, far from home, kids being placed in foster homes when really they need more intensive care right. or the opposite of kids being placed in like group homes when all they need is a, a, a foster home or some kind of kin that would be able to support them. So we really do have an under-resourced child welfare system mm -hmm. and kids and families are, uh, you know, suffering as, as a result. Yeah. Teresa, what, from your members' perspective? So I want to piggyback on what Mark was just saying around residential programs, because I think they, you know, through the COVID pandemic, they really bore the brunt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have to social distance and you have to create more space, um, one of the things we saw across the board with residential programs was they had to reduce capacity, which has financial implications, it has workforce implications, and then those are the jobs that require non-traditional hours, evenings, weekends, mandatory overtime, all the things that people don't want to do and required people to really put their own health at safety and well-being um, at risk and that of their families just to continue to do a job. And so many people made different life choices, really hard decisions many times. But I think that's been an ongoing challenge in staffing residential programs that you see trickle out. And, and I think, you know, with, with foster families, the same thing. Do I wanna bring somebody into my home when it may create additional risk to the health and safety of my own family? And that's something that was new and different with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, couple that with new federal requirements from the Family First Prevention Services Act that increased, you know, um, regulatory requirements, some of them in, in a good way, but at a time when we were also then dealing with all of these new challenges um, that then didn't come with any increase in financial compensation. And so those, that's a real hard sell in terms of trying to figure out how do you staff and maintain um, residential capacity for these, you know, these youth that really have intensive behavioral health needs. And then circle back to one of the comments, Patrick, you made earlier about the increase in behavioral challenges. So we're not, you know, the externalizing behavior, mm -hmm. um, the kids that are, you know, are more violent or explosive. And that becomes a bigger challenge too, because now you have an added element of behavioral challenge that may require double staffing or triple staffing for one child in terms of being able to just manage and, and provide the level of care that one child needs while you're trying to manage an entire unit of children. 
And then the other thing that I don't think we talk enough about, but it's the impact of the opiate ep epidemic and the overdose deaths. I mean, we did not see a decline. In fact, we saw a 27% increase in overdose deaths um, for 2021. Part of that due to the isolation and the challenges of the pandemic, the increase of fentanyl in the illicit drug supply, the commingling of fentanyl into every other type of drug that's available on the, you know, on the black market. Um, and so we're seeing deaths crop up, but what that's resulting in is orphan children. And so who's taking care of these kids? Um, the number of children that we know or don't know who are just living with someone, someone decided to take care of this child, but that someone may not have the resources to go to court to be legally named their guardian. And so I'm concerned about what this is going to mean longer term when we get to adolescence. And now we have this increase and in new rise of, of homelessness or in state unstably housed youth who may or may not really have a legal guardian or who, and it may be kin that's taking care of them, but it may just be the neighbor down the street who mm -hmm. took pity on this particular child. Um, the number of infants that we're seeing, you know, continuing to, to have challenges and trying to find and create those treatment programs that serve, you know, the mom and baby, the dyad or the, you know, the family unit and provide that level of care. Um, certainly the START program has done some really good things in creating peer support and programs, but we need more of that. And that's one of the big burdens that we see, not just on, you know, on the child welfare system for sure, um, but I think we'll start to see impacting more and more on the juvenile justice um, population, particularly for those youth that don't have the level of supervision, connectivity and commitment um, from a family member or a caring adult who's gonna stick with them through the challenging times. Yeah, thanks. Those are both, both of you providing, I think some really great insights into how our, like I said, how our sister systems are also in, in crisis as well, processing through their challenges. Um, where I'd like to wrap up, um, this has been a great conversation. Um, I'm wondering if each of you could identify a couple of the areas that you're most concerned about going forward, um, things that may feel less where they need to be <laughs> or you want them to be. Um, and that can be at any level, state level, organizational levels, provider level, but the kinds of things that, and, and I think you've both shared certainly areas of ongoing concern. So maybe a couple of what you see as I don't want to say they're totally daunting, but maybe daunting challenges, but then flip that and, and wrap up with where you see the greatest potential. Um, and we did, you know, Mark, you talked about that a little bit earlier in terms of the resources, but what other things are you seeing emerging from these, this new kind of awareness, this new kind of attention that give you and your members um, a sense of hopefulness, a sense of, hmm, okay, it's tough, but, so. Sure. Um, so when it comes to the issue that has anything to do with children's mental health and workforce and resources, the one issue that is the most concerning for me has to do with all of the stigma around intensive services for kids. Mm. Um, there is a level of care in children's mental health. And on that level of care is intensive residential treatment services for children. And I can't tell you um, how many reports, or white papers or testimonies I read, usually on the federal national level that really demonize the idea that children um, should ever receive very intensive services. Mm. Um, 
I mean, even from extremely reputable organizations and associations, it I, f I feel like um, there's just all these arrows pointing at this level of care. And there's there's some merit to that because sometimes the level of care hasn't been regulated enough or it's been misused or children have lingered there too long. But there's also the level of care. It is a level and it's essential. And what we're seeing in Ohio is that because we don't have enough of it, worse things happen. Kids are being placed into facilities in Utah, in Florida, and into academies in Pennsylvania. And families go without care and they have to relinquish custody of their children. So I, I'm just really, really concerned about the, the viability of residential care in general. It's only compounded by the pandemic. It's only compounded by today's workforce crisis. But um, policymakers um, and funders really um, are, are part of this too. Uh, but perhaps the silver lining in the area of, of hope that I have is a brand new program that starts in Ohio in two weeks, which is Ohio Rise. Ohio Rise is uh, a, a new unique program uh, for kids on Medicaid that have behavioral health conditions. Mm -hmm. And it's not for everyone, and it's going to start small and grow bigger. But the, the really hopeful part of it is that for the first time, Ohio will be heavily investing in wraparound services that puts the kids and families right in the center. And it's gonna be an experiment and it's gonna be probably rocky to a certain degree, mm -hmm. uh, but we're going all in and we're gonna figure it out and continually improve over time. So despite all the crazy challenges that we're facing in Ohio and all the the struggles that kids and families are facing, I have a lot of hope and expectations that uh, maybe not immediately, but over the next several months and next couple of years, that Ohio Rise will begin to solve decades long problems uh, for kids and families in Ohio. Okay, great. You know, and I, and, um, I appreciate those um, reflections. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly be doing a um, podcast on Ohio Rise. Um, I'm thinking we might want to wait a little bit past launch date. <laughs> um, so we have some reflecting we can do. Um, but clearly, um, there's been so much generated about and with Ohio Rise. And I've actually done a couple of articles for the Center for Community Solutions, just kind of putting in general language kind of what's happening and pushing pushing it out there. So lots of people are concerned in watching it. Um, Teresa, you're, 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 here's what I'm, uh, and here's what I'm hopeful about. Sure. So I would, you know, I would echo what Mark said about, you know, residential and, and Ohio Rise, but kind of taking a little broader lens. The thing that most concerns me is, do we have the bandwidth to sustain the inflationary cost and the wage compression that we're experiencing today? So really thinking about the workforce and the community systems, which many people view as kind of the safety net, the last ditch effort. And we've been underfinanced, underrecognized for so long. And the between you know, the challenges of behavioral health redesign, we were just getting back to maybe equilibrium when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And then the amount of resources that providers had to invest just to sustain, just to sustain basic operations. And we're, you know, as Mark indicated, there's been incredible amount of federal and state investment in workforce and retention activities a lot of flexibility given to providers, but those dollars are, are, are drying up. I mean, we this last round of funding through the Holman Community-Based Services, through ARPA, you know, has been incredibly important, mm -hmm. but that's the last known bucket of dollars. So what happens next in terms of how do we attract and retain the workforce that we have 
without so fracturing our ability to sustain a, a basic level of care. Mm -hmm. You know, our providers, providers are already making hard decisions sure. around, you know, if I do an intensive home-based service, I have two therapists who can serve, you know, eight children, nine, you know, 10 children maybe. But if I take those same two therapists and move them to outpatient care, I can now serve 60 to 80 children. Mm -hmm. So what decision do I make? Yep. And so this comes back to how do we provide that continuum of care um, in a way that doesn't completely fracture the community-based nature of what we do? Because it's so critically important. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a sense growing that we can just serve people through convenient care. You know, the health hub that CVS is creating, that Walgreens is creating, and we're going to just do, you know, we're going to create one-stop shops um, at Walmart, at Walgreens, at CVS, and that will work for a whole lot of families, mm -hmm. but not the kind of families that we're so used to serving across, you know, the, our child serving systems, those kids that are multi-system involved. They really need that in-home care. And I'm worried that that's going to be the issue that we don't solve. And then how do we enforce parity, insurance parity, so that we don't continue to create a system of haves and have nots, that if you have Medicaid, you can get services, mm -hmm. but if you have commercial insurance and you can't afford to pay cash, then you really don't have access to care. So that we don't allow people to continue to spiral down yeah. um, into you know, the disease <laughs> of despair as we talk about it or into their depression or into the substance mm -hmm. use. Um, but we really allow people to, to use a benefit that's been made available to them or that their, their, their family's employer has purchased that they're paying into to really meet their needs. Because that's a story that frankly I hear all too often. So that's probably what I'm most concerned about. I think I'll come back full circle to what I talked about earlier is the silver lining is everybody's talking about it. Everybody's talking about mental health. Everybody's talking about how we solve the, the substance use crisis. We're even talking about the challenges of alcohol use more. Um, and you know we don't have enough time in this podcast to talk about the, the impact of that as a gateway for kids. But really looking at how do we start to think about this as improving the overall health and wellness of, of people, but also our communities and our workforce. Mm -hmm. Because if Ohio wants to be a vibrant place that's attractive to employers and jobs and industry, we have to have a healthy and productive workforce. And we have to have the next generation that's healthy and productive. So how do we think about that and harness that energy to really bring people together to solve these problems, to really elevate the value of this workforce, to elevate the needs that we have and to solve the problems because they're not, they're, we, we can overcome them. We just have to figure out how we want to do it and that we're willing to make the needed investments. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, those are um, profound what strategies that you're sharing and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the passion that you both bring to this work. Um, that is one of the things that makes me feel hopeful is folks like you all who are at the various tables um, and there are many <laughs> tables, um, you know, putting these ideas, putting these recommendations, putting these strategies forward um, to policymakers, to funders, um, to the community um, at large. Um, your work is just exquisitely relevant um, at the moment. Um, always has been, but I think this is, again, one of those moments where I think we really need to take advantage in the best sense of that strategy. Um, to keep moving forward. Um, thanks to both of you so much for taking a big chunk of your day uh, and time to have this discussion. I hope we can do it again. I'm thinking you might want to have some things to say about Ohio Rise um, six months down the road or uh, <laughs> 12 months down the road, so we can do some reflecting on that, um, because I know you're um, observations will be thoughtful and, and helpful. So 
Thanks to you both. Stay well. And again, appreciate so much your time.